Thank you, Jen. Uh, appreciate that, uh, laying the foundation here. Uh, I just have a few more things before we get into our topic from the day. Um, and, and as you probably all saw, you uh, saw some of the, the program, the scheduling, the agenda. I'm gonna be speaking now for about 45 minutes or so. And we'll have some time for some questions and a poll that we're gonna put out. And then we have a panel um, uh, later on after that with um, just some various uh, uh, folks representing different parts of the industry. So uh, today kind of is, the, is laying the foundation. Uh, I know that you'll see the title, what got us here won't get you there. And I'll explain that a little bit, but kind of laying the foundation here. Some, some of you, you know, kind of get it, you know that, but even if you do, there might be some points here to help us understand uh, more of um, why we're doing this, why we're talking about it, and then talking about the how is, is later on throughout the week. And then that's what we'll do tomorrow. We'll talk more about effective, effectively communicating with those that we influence. Doesn't matter if you're a farmer or if you're a crop consultant or if you're selling something, uh, how can you better affect, how can you more effectively communicate? And then the big one for farmers in particular and for all of us on, uh, on uh, Thursday is the economics of cover crops. Do cover crops pay? That's still the biggest question that's asked these days. And we'll wrap up more with a little bit more practical applications and, and how this all works. So today, welcome, day one. What got you here won't get you there. You may wonder what is behind that title and I'm gonna kind of let it play out. But it simply means what got us to this point in the soil health journey, I'll call it, may not get you into the next 10, 20 years from now. There are different influences of why we're here today, and those will probably change in the future. So let me tell you a little bit of my story. Back in 1982, a lot of you weren't born yet, I know, but uh, that's the year I graduated from high school. We had ditches in our fields. And I just thought that that was just something that we, uh, an extra bit of work to do to, to close them ditches up. Um, I didn't take pictures of those ditches back in 1982 because I didn't know I was gonna be talking to you today. Uh, but we just closed them up some years in order to be able to harvest our crops in the fall. That was what caused me to look into changing the way I farm. It was something personal. It was an inconvenience. It had nothing to do with soil health, nothing to do with saving the Chesapeake Bay. Frankly, 1982, I could have cared less. I didn't really know there was a problem. So that's not why I got into no-till and later on cover crops. We did start getting into cover crops shortly thereafter. And now we use the term planting green, which we'll talk about it later. Yes, I started doing that and I have a picture here of 84. I can't believe how good it worked back then with the little we knew, but it worked. I didn't really do it exclusively back then, but we started to do it. As the years went on, we got more interested in cover crops in the mid nineties. I heard about rolling cover crops from um, the Brazilians in South America. And you know what my motivation at that point was? The price of Roundup was 40 to $50 a gallon. And I thought if I could roll these cover crops, I could maybe cut my Roundup rates in half, which is like 20 bucks or more per acre. That's what motivated me to start using a roller. I think it's the first roller in the United States. And we'll talk about this later. It is kind of Run from there, but nobody's using a roller now, probably just to save on Roundup herbicide or glyphosate. Um, and, and you know, it's it's like dirt cheap right now, and we're trying to get away from glyphosate. So it's interesting how these things happen. And I'm just going to go back to you all personally. Why are you here today? What got you here? Um, why are you interested in cover crops and no-till and soil health and all those questions? Uh, later on, a little bit more of my journey, my, most of you heard about the tillage radish. Um, that's something that was developed with the University of Maryland here on my farm. This is our first plot back in 2001. Uh, we later trademarked the name and 
started to see business out of it. <clears throat> and Tilly Radish is considered from somebody, some people, like the spark plug of the cover crop movement. It was something you could really see a difference. The soil was more mellow. Farmers adopted it quickly. And uh, now tillage radishes or any radishes that are out there are more used as a salt and pepper in the context of a cover crop mix. You don't see many straight uh, single species tillage radish planted anymore. I'm just sharing all this to you is why I started all these things is no longer the reason why I'm using them. And that's fascinating because it leads to the future. Where will we end up? A um, few things to keep in mind here. You can't buy soil health. It's not made in a bag or a bottle. Soil health comes about with your management. And I'm gonna keep referring also, because we know we have a lot of crop consultants and other influencers, other farmers here, those you influence and how they manage. Helping them be a good manager is important. You can't buy soil health, it has to be made. And that's important to understand, it's your management that's gonna make it successful. A challenge I'm gonna throw out right up front, do you know how to manage your soils in the way they were designed to function? So I could come and help you in your farm and your soils are probably different than mine. A lot of the principles are the same worldwide, but on your farm, we would have to adjust and adopt, understand how your soils are designed to function, and we would be able to um, learn from there and provide better management techniques. I'm gonna promote a book that was really helpful for me, The Soil Owner's Manual by John Sticka. Um, it's available out there easily off Amazon or wherever. Um, it helped me because it really put in words a lot of things that were in my mind. And I'm going to recommend this to you because it's an easy read, helps you understand how your soil was designed to function. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. So I'm recommending this book would be a good resource for you. Now let's think a little bit deeper here. And you know how it is in life where sometimes you just have to have perspective and that helps you understand things. We need to talk about complexity and diversity. You see, the cover crop movement, the soil health movement, the no-till movement, I'm gonna use those terms kind of interchangeably. They are very simple concepts, pretty easy to describe, pretty easy to understand but every single one of them are very complex and there's a lot of diversity of how to make it work as well as to make them work. I feel you need to have diversity. I'm going to talk about that later. So wherever you're from today, your soils were formed by multiple species and had living roots in the soil at all times. It's the way the planet was designed to function. I'd like to say it's the way God designed it to function. And so we in agriculture need to take a look at this and think about that and try to, as you're gonna hear this theme, work with nature more than work against nature. Now, again, I'm not suggesting here that we go out and forage for berries and nuts. Some of you like to do that on a summer weekend, Sunday afternoon, I get that. But in our agriculture food production system, we need to farm in such a way, we wanna to try to mimic nature as much as possible. I can say that now, after many decades, I think all you agree with this, that we've farmed in a way that is more on a year to year to basis. What can I grow this year? How can my yields be this year? Um, and, and so forth. I am suggesting we need to think now about some of the bigger picture here and how we can mimic nature in our farm. <clears throat> Look at my farm. This is 30 years ago. This is, uh, we used to grow some squash. This is one of my fields. Notice all the stones, uh, the little stones. This is typical in my fields. This would have been plowed, discs, harrowed, cultivated a couple times probably. And here we are at harvest, bare soil, stone showing, all susceptible to erosion. All these things. And 
Uh, if you look at my fields uh, now, they're covered. So I'm trying to follow that principle, trying to mimic nature in the context of growing food. We have our soil covered here. We have diversity. We have living roots. This was a picture here. You can see there was a cover crop of rye, cereal rye and hairy vetch rolled with a roller, planted 15 inch corn, took it off as silage, came back with my 15 inch planter, planted a mixed species of cover crops. I love this picture because it kind of where I'm at right now, it depicts trying to mimic the principles of nature, I'll say, the field's covered, there's living roots, and there's diversity. So um, we'll get into this more later, but some of the benefits here is we, we've actually, you know, we've, we've come out of the, using the word sustainable farming, and that's a good word. We've, we've, we're sustaining, we're keeping our soil in place. We pretty much solved that. Now kind of the buzzword is more regenerative agriculture. We're regenerating the soil. We're, we're, not, we're going beyond just sustaining it but we're making it better. We're increasing organic matter. We're, um, our soil is not as dependable on uh, inputs as much. So uh, this is, I know a lot of you have, um, are working with farmers who are going this route, but this is kind of the principles here, what I'm talking about. So one of the parameters that we can measure, and this is pretty elementary, but um, is, uh, is the value of organic matter. So my organic matter in my farm is nearly tripled. That's over uh, three decades. You'll hear other farmers uh, say they can get tremendous results. I could have done a, a lot better had I known what I know now 30, 35 years ago. So we keep learning. Uh, that's one thing that's tangible here. But the, the fact that we've moved our organic matter is not so much because I use cover crops and no-till. Um, it's because of the management of them that did that. Because with straight no-till, it's not enough. Yeah, you can move some organic matter in a positive direction. I know that. But adding cover crops is one dynamic. Another dynamic then is adding a diversity. And um, I just want to share some of my personal goals here. And um, I'm not so concerned where you're at as a farmer or where you're at as a crop consultant or an agriculture influencer. What I'm concerned about though, is where you're headed. Uh, what, what is the direction here? Uh, lower pesticide and fertilizer use is something that I have, uh, have a, a keen sense of value and wanna do. And don't think I'm crazy, but I'm not trying to grow commodity crops. Um, I have the opportunity, I live here in the Mid-Atlantic region in Southeastern Pennsylvania. I have been a vegetable farmer, third generation. So I know a little bit how to do that. So it's easy for me to, to say this, um, but that's just one of my goals to stick with more high value specialty crops. The other thing too, that may be of interest and it doesn't matter what you're farming is to pursue increased nutrient density and quality. We as farmers historically been paid for yield. Uh, we haven't been paid for quality. Um, I'm, I'm on the, the mission to have that turned around. And I think by, I actually know, by using what we call regenerative agriculture principles, we're able to grow a healthier food product. That's still being researched, discussed. You know, we don't know a lot yet about that, but it's coming. And the other thing you see down there is diversity, diversity, diversity. That I'm gonna say is the key to making these principles work. We see it in nature. That's the one thing it's steadfast all around the world. You always see it, that's how it works. My diversity journey has evolved. Back in 82, I counted up what I remember we grew back then. It was just a total of seven species on the farm. Uh, the last time I kept track of everything, 2019, it changes in and out a little bit, but I'm just giving you real numbers here. We had over 27 species of different crops, some cash crops, some cover crops, some both. It's really nice when you can have a cover crop that's also a cash crop, which in this context, I'm referring to either forage or I do grow some cover crops for seeds. So that kind of counts in that category. 
Okay, that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. So, so you can kind of get to know me a little bit. Now I want to um, lay out mindsets. Mindsets matter. Um, there's two things here. How are you when it comes to adopting some of this stuff? Are you on this webinar today thinking, well, my neighbor says he's bugging me that I need to start growing cover crop or my son or my dad or my colleague. They want to give this a try. If your mindset is, I'm going to give this a try, it may work. Maybe it won't. It's an easy out, not much of a commitment. If you say, I'm going to make this work, and I'm not meaning some indiscriminate attitude. Um, I'm, I'm talking about some of you're serious about it. I'm going to make this work because I believe there's enough information that I have access to neighbors I know are doing it and so forth. I'm going to make this work. Which mindset are you? I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to make this work. Which mindset has the best chance to succeed? I think it's clear. And I want to just say right now, think about that, where you're coming from, because it's going to make a difference in, uh, in how successful you might be. So back to my nature analogy. This is a picture of my woods this past summer. Um, you look at that, it's nice and lush, it's green, it's diverse, um, and this is typical. And you know what's interesting is there's no fertilizers applied, no pesticides applied. And when you, if you, did, did you ever take a soil test of your woods? You might be amazed at how low the amount of nutrients are there. In my woods, for example, the calcium levels are 29%. You would say there's no way anything could grow. Well, I don't know, maybe hardwood trees can grow at 29%. But what I do know is nothing's been applied and this looks lush. What can we learn from that? You should be asking questions now. Well, that's intriguing. You know, can we grow crops in a way that we don't need as many inputs? And I would say at the very least, we can. And we're, pre we're proving it, different farmers are proving it and so forth. Um, so the key here is the biology. And I don't have a good scientific knowledge of what all's in there, but it's the biology that's making this work. We as farmers have forgotten, ignored, or don't care about biology in the last, what, 100 years? Because we could buy stuff in a bag or a bottle to solve our problems. That was easy. That's the easy button. And we have people selling this stuff, convincing us why we need their stuff. I'm not against the stuff, but I am against thinking that that's going to be the future. Um, let's talk about that. We need to work with nature. We have been taught, I used to be taught, still out there today, that we need to control nature. And there's still a certain amount of that we need to do. But we have an attitude of, what am I going to kill today? You know, you see a bug, the first question, what insecticide do I need to buy to kill that bug? And there's no thought of what the ramifications are of that. Um, I would rather propose, how do we get more life into our operation? Now this, you might be trembling with fear because you have no idea, but we're starting to get there collectively in agriculture. There's movements that are beginning to show this. I mean, the organic people have been kind of on this for decades. Now we have what we call regenerative agriculture. It's tapping into this. There's something here in the biology. How can I mimic nature? How can I nurture it? That's a word that I want you to think about. Nurture. We know what it means. But how can I nurture my fields? How can I nurture what I have there? I think that's appropriate. You see, most of our education as farmers comes from retailers selling their products. Again, not a bad thing, but you need to understand where we're at today in today's culture of agriculture. Who are the champions promoting soil health? It's not John Deere. It's not Monsanto. Name your company. It's probably not. Now they're kind of trying to fall in line now, but the leading edge is pretty much farmers a few NRCS government people, a few organizations. We have Stroud Water on here 
promoting this. Uh, the National Fish and Wildlife is helping to uh, support this. We have uh, Jan on with her, uh, her company with uh, resourcing people, but it's primarily more of a grassroots effort, which is a great pun, by the way. Um, so it's just something to think about in the context. Is your pesticide or fertilizer dealer actively promoting soil health? Most of them are not. I've literally been told at a meeting I went to speak at, Steve, could you just turn down the uh, less pesticide rhetoric? That's where we make our money. And he said, well, you're paying me to come speak, I understand, but you might wanna think about promoting, educating soil health, because I think that's the future. You may become obsolete if you don't at least think about that. Sounds maybe harsh, but I firmly believe that's where we're headed. Nobody's selling soil health. I said it several times, uh, but I just wanna remind us, this is, it, it comes back to some of the challenges we collectively, those of us in this uh, soil health movement, this is one of the challenges we run up against. Uh, so it's the management of those products that is what's gonna really make a difference. You see the fear of losing yields is a powerful marketing tool in agriculture. I've said already that you could take one single issue of a major farm magazine, and if you would buy every single product in that magazine, you should be getting 600 bushel yields, right? Because they're always saying, you use this product, you get 4.9 more bushel. You use this product, we've seen yields increase 25 bushel. I'm not against that, please hear me. But what I am saying is the fear of losing yields is what's the underlying motivator for a lot of products that are out there. I would rather promote that we need to look at our return on investment, the ROI. And I feel that we can reduce some of our inputs and still maintain yields, maybe not get quite as high, but we can still maintain and provide a better quality product. Probably another full discussion for another day, but I'm just gonna put it out, put it out there. Because you see, researching and the influences of biology is slow. And we don't have time to wait sometimes in our culture. Uh, we wanna know everything, does it pay if I do this this year? Um, and we don't think in a 10 year uh, system approach, which I'll just tell you is, I think is what we need to be thinking about. It's very hard to quantify. And it's also affected by many variables. So typically what we're used to is dealing with products that have been tested millions if not billions of dollars collectively spent on how to use these products. Just imagine in the context now of the very little we really know about biology, if that could be, there could be some research that would help us better understand what's literally under our feet. Well, <laughs> some of you have seen these memes going around. I like, sorry, I couldn't resist. Frankly, I've seen enough, but I couldn't resist today to put this in here. Uh, for those of you who don't get this, you just, you, you haven't been on social media recently. Um, so uh, it just, it just, I just thought this was kind of cute. And for those of you starting to fall asleep, maybe you're awake now. But anyway, when they say cover crops won't work because it's too cold here, and then you're watching cereal rye grow in January. And uh, anyway, just, uh, just something to bring a little humor here. It's one of the better ones that I've seen out there. Okay, now that you're all awake again. Um, one of the things that's really, really important here is to understand what you are trying to accomplish. Again, those of you who are influencing farmers, there's gonna be a lot of things out there. If you are a farmer, there are many things that you may be trying to accomplish. You know, it could be soil erosion. That's what, that's what got me started. Uh, it could be uh, you wanna increase your organic matter. It could be you wanna lower your inputs. So there's a lot of things out there. Um, one of the things when you start getting into this, and I will say this as a fact now, once we start understanding this, your soil will be more resilient to weather extremes. And I think this, as we, as we kind of are changing now to the what got you here won't get you there. Um, you know, what, why I started using cover crops, and it's now not the main reason I'm using cover crops and they're doing soil health. Being resilient to weather extremes is very pertinent these days. And this is getting some attention to farmers that you know, we, we know we have, we have crop insurance. I view crop insurance as a Band-Aid. 
Um, I'm, I know I'm going to offend a few of you, but that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I would say I, my crop insurance is getting a more resilient soil so that I can weather those extremes. We're going to talk a little bit later on about a marketing advantage. Uh, and I see that as gathering um, more momentum here as we move forward. But in this whole journey, there are no shortcuts. This is where the management comes in. This is where the learning, the education and everything. There are no shortcuts. You just can't read an article and say, I'm gonna do that. You have to understand that this is a system. And I know we've all heard this probably dozens of times. I'm promoting a 10 year plan. Think of it as 10 years. This is a kind of a very cool diagram here where you got a lot of the principles covered. Soil's literally covered, there's stuff growing there, cash crops, cover crops. You have now have the local ecosystem, the birds, um, you know, the insects, the good insects, the good nematodes, you know, all these things, wildlife are starting to take shape. It doesn't happen in one year. And this is the point I'm trying to make here. Think of this as a 10 year plan. So <clears throat> you got questions, we got answers. The reason I highlight that there is the answers aren't just for me. I don't know it all. I've been doing this for many years and I still am greatly intrigued. I'm very curious about what there is to learn. The answers to your specific questions might be with other people in the webinar here, might be your neighboring farmers, might be with the NRCS, university, industry. All of these things can work together no matter where you are today, no matter what you're doing, all of these lists here you should be involved with because it takes us all. That's why I say we got answers. It's not just about one person. And we have some cover crop champions, soil health champions, regenerative agriculture questions that have really done a great job in getting us inspired. And I love it. I love to see, I'm seeing more and more, you know, for me personally now, it's kind of getting to be one of the older guys. Uh, I love to see this younger generation coming up with new ideas, things that I would have never thought about or our generation would never thought about. It's really cool. And part of that now is the story of regenerative agriculture, and I'm just gonna use that word here, is very compelling. And I might add easy to share with the end users of our products. If you're doing grain, if you're growing vegetables, doesn't matter. Um, I use the, uh, I do this, and I'm, I'm obviously from the Chesapeake Bay, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And if a non-farmer will come up to me sometimes and say, so I see you in the paper once in a while, and what is this cover crop thing you talk about? And I will say, well, cover crops help keep nitrates out of the Chesapeake Bay and your well water or your water. And right away, they're hooked. That's all I have to say. And now I'm the good guy because of what I'm doing. And it's, it's true, I can back it up. Uh, it's a little hard to debate sometimes topics like genetic engineering, the use of glyphosate. Usually people are pretty dug in. <laughs> so we're trying, when I tell people, I'm trying to get away from all that stuff, you know, that's good enough. And I tell them, this is what I'm doing. Water quality affects us all. So that's one of the stories that I like to say. Now, a little practicality here. You say, this is all great, Steve, but uh, I know there's challenges out there. Cost of seed, uh, specialized equipment, lack of knowledge, it's a big thing yet. Uh, although we have more knowledge now than ever, and that's increasing. Research, it's coming along slower than we'd all like. Experience, getting more and more farmers experience now, and that's an awesome thing. And I'm just encouraging no matter what you do, if you're a farmer, your consultant, tap into the farmers who are making it work. I'm not gonna spend time today discussing these challenges. I'm just gonna put them out there. I wanna focus more today on, on the principles. Treat your cash crops, treat your, excuse me, treat your cover crops like your cash crops. If a farmer does that, he's gonna stand a much better chance of success. Uh, that's very important. What are you trying to accomplish? is another thing. And, and if you're, uh, you're advising people, ask this question, kind of get to the root of it. A lot of it is water erosion. That's it. It's a fairly easy thing to address. Uh, plant some cover crops, reduce or eliminate your tillage. You have to know what you're doing. I wanna share a quick story. I was in Bulgaria a couple of years ago 
<clears throat> the farmer there on the uh, on the left had just planted the day before, uh, planted green, as you can see there, and he grew squash. And I asked him, so where did you hear about this? He goes, oh, Steve, I watched one of your webinars or your videos on YouTube. And I saw it and I thought, oh boy, I hope this works out. You know, my reputation's on the line here. Uh, so um, then I'm over there, I see this, I started taking pictures of these little ladybugs. And he said, what are you looking at? I said, oh, it's just some ladybugs here. He goes, it works, it works. I said, what do you mean? He said, that's what you said it would happen. The beneficial insects would come. Well, it was kind of a cool moment because I felt a lot better that actually you noticed the difference. Uh, but the key here I'm trying to bring out is, do you know what to look for? He knew what to look for because he was educating himself. Do you know what to look for? Beneficial insects is just one of the many things. You see, you just can't throw on cover crops and expect miracles. Sometimes, you know, there's some passionate folks out there who are, you know, pretty, kind of almost communicating this way. It is tough. It's complex. So I'm just going to acknowledge it. It's not easy. And uh, you need to know what you're doing a little bit. Um, <clears throat> this is a farmer friend of mine uh, that's with the Pennsylvania Nuto Alliance, uh, Ben Peckman in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. He's rolling down rye, planting corn at the same time. And obviously it's pretty much the end of the corn season. This is one of his lower lying fields, tends to stay wet longer. Cover crop helps take the moisture out and then helps hold it in in August when it gets hot and dry. So there we are, this is an example here. I like to call it technology and biology or the foundation of agricultural progress for this century. So that's just an example there of some of the things we're talking about. There's a lot of creative farmers out there. I was in, all, in Argentina a little over a year ago. 95% is no-till. Yes, it's true. I saw it, but they're lagging in cover crop use, only 15%. One of the things is water management. We know that cover crops can help take water out of the soil, can help keep it in. And I will admit, the weather works wrong. Sometimes the cover crops will take moisture out that negatively impacts your cash crop. That happens sometimes, that's farming. I will say that if you get to the point where it's getting dry and there's no rain in sight, you might want to terminate your cover crop earlier. Management, that's management. So in this picture, uh, I took this picture in Argentina. There's three inches of rain the night before. This was an, a, a farmer experiment where he started planting cover crops for the last five years on the right. Notice there's no standing water. No-till is not good enough. You have to use cover crops. And I will say no-till and cover crops is not good enough. You got to get more diversity and so forth in your uh, rotation. So uh, coming back now to my farm in Southern Lancaster County, I'm planting corn into crimson clover. And there's some hairy vetch in there, a few other things. Five bucks worth of herbicide, just a little burn down. Only 80 pounds of nitrogen needed. Maybe I didn't even need that. A nice yield of silage. Um, and by the way, we weighed it because I sold it to the neighbor. We didn't take anything off for the deer damage along the woods out there. But there's just an example of some of the things you can do by cutting our cost. Now, most of you know I'm from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. It's a very unique county. If you're not familiar with the area, a lot of small farms, a lot of Amish farms. You can kind of see this is just a typical layout of the, um, I like to say, this is the good part of the county. I live in the River Hills, a little bit more hilly, more well-drained. We dry out a little quicker. Um, but this is uh, just uh, west of, uh, of Lancaster City. And what I just want to show you here, this was actually a couple of years ago, how green it is. First week of December, I uh, went out up in an airplane with a friend of mine just to take pictures of how green it was. And we have taken surveys repeatedly, and we're solidly 65% cover, cover crop, solidly 70% no-till. And that's just something that primarily because of the Chesapeake Bay awareness that farmers are now regularly and, and quite, quite popularly, I'd say, using cover crop. Interesting, um, in 2019, I didn't get the 2020 data yet, but in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, we'd like to talk about yield, right? Remember I said that, that yield's a driving factor. 
Uh, well, interestingly enough, of the 2019 Pennsylvania corn yield contestants, these are the good managers, right? That's what we, that's what we always say. 71% of the contestant entries were no-till and 35% used cover crops in that year. I thought that was fascinating information to see. Now we have been doing this in our area. The, the big motivator was cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. And I think in the farming community, at first we, including me, resisted it. And in the 1980s, because it's like, don't tell me how to farm. You know, I'm doing the best I can. Leave me alone. Now it's like, wow, this whole cover crop and no-till thing's working after all. You don't even have to pay me to do it anymore. We'll just do it. It's not worth the paperwork. Now I'm I'm not saying everybody does that, but a significant amount do. We're starting to see a turnaround. Now, I'm going to quickly say, not near done. A lot more work to do, but we're starting to see a turnaround with the uh, health of the Chesapeake Bay. We are making a difference. And um, I've talked to the fishermen in the Chesapeake Bay. I've been there. I've been at their places. And they are thanking me um, for that. And I've been told by the fishermen, please tell the farmers um, that thank you for what you're doing because our water quality is starting to get better. Again, more work to do, but that is encouraging. Um, I actually filmed uh, as part of a documentary uh, that we filmed down there to just to discuss this. And it was really fun for me to kind of connect with someone who I influence. You influence whatever watershed you're in. You're influencing something with water quality. I guarantee it. But it was kind of cool here. And they come up with this uh, really nice documentary. And I'm going to promote it here. Livingsoilfilm.com because it fits right into our topic today. You can download it. Um, it's been, I think, almost a million views now or something crazy like that. Uh, there's profiles, a lot of farmers across the US. Very good, very good to see all the different expressions of exactly what I'm talking about today. Livingsoilfilm.com, you can watch it online. Back to our webinar. You see, cover crops make good farmers better and bad farmers worse. And you know the difference? Management. It comes back to management. That's the difference there. And helping your management is to have the right mentors, have the right people that you have in your, uh, you know, your connections and everything you do it. And, and you know, who is that? The other thing is some other factors, including in, in influencing cover crop adoption. Is it going to be regulations or the market? You see, I would rather educate than legislate. That's just kind of where I'm coming from. So the keys to cover crop success is then to learn all you can. And in this transition here, my topic, learn where the future may be going. I wrote in my, uh, my book, The Future Proof Farm, uh, chapter two is she's your new boss. Basically a metaphor for, we'll say the millennial shopper these days, who they care about how their food was grown. So whether you're a farmer, whoever you're growing for, your end user cares more about how their food was grown than they used to. A lot of that's because of social media and so forth. Um, and, and I'm just saying that this is something you need to pay attention to. If you don't, you may become obsolete. Um, so I work with companies all over the world this is an international company, Bonduel. Most of you probably never heard of it, but it's the largest frozen uh, vegetable company in the world based in France. And they are now promoting um, uh, you know, soil health type principles, regenerative agriculture principles. Why? Because their market wants it and they wanna market to as many people as possible. I spoke there in uh, the country of Hungary. They have operations all over. Europe and they own Green Giant, which some of you may have heard of here in, um, in the States. So I had a, a privilege of speaking there and talking to some of their, uh, their managers in that. Coming stateside here, some of you may know about a, a, a company of uh, restaurants called Sweet Green. I was, I was contacted by them because they heard about how I grow my produce. And we went to visit 
uh, one of their uh, stores and, and actually ate there. And I had a man come up to me. I asked to take this picture right here, right? Because there were so many people, there was, a, there was a line there. I said, you mind if I take my picture here? I said, I'm the farmer that grew the squash that they use here. And he says, you're a farmer? I'm like, yeah. He reached his hand out and shook my hand. He said, I never met a farmer before. And I, of course, we talked a little bit. And you know what I thought? I never get that treatment when I'm dumping a load of corn at the local grain elevator. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's just a matter of fact, which is fine. I'm just using the analogy there. So having someone show their appreciation was important. You know what I'm doing now? I'm growing crimson clover. They're making it into a tea and they're selling crimson clover tea uh, at these restaurants. Pretty cool when you can cash in on cover crops. Um, just want to wrap up here. I just got a couple minutes left. I also have worked with Whole Foods. Many of you heard of, uh, of Whole Foods. They have a, a, a program that they have used uh, in the past that identifies uh, soil health principles. It helps you a lot. The reason um, that we're using cover crops and no-till in pumpkin production is cleaner pumpkins. It's a value-added process. It's the market helping us do this. 75% of the pumpkins in Pennsylvania are now no-till. A big driving factor was cleaner pumpkin. So what are those opportunities out there? There's new markets, lower your cost, more profits. And I've heard more than one farmer tell me, this makes farming fun again. And so that's pretty cool to be able to hear that. You know, another thing I like to mention is public perception. We as farmers tend to be on the defensive a lot of times. But when you can tell the cover crop story, it is very, very compelling and very easy to say, uh, share. This is what got me started. Soil erosion. What, why are you listening today? I hope you've been able to uh, think about that a little bit. The Chesapeake Bay and the problems in that is really was the driving force in the Mid-Atlantic region. Those arrows can show you, this is an actual satellite image showing after a rain event on Virginia, how the water turned brown. You can see that over there. The Chesapeake Bay region is, is um, about the size of the state of Wisconsin. So all of us in this uh, Chesapeake Bay have an influence on the water quality there. That is really part of what I feel has gotten us here. I challenge you to take 10% of your acreage if you're a farmer to step it up a notch. And if you're a crop consultant or an influencer, I challenge you to take it up a notch. I put 10% out there because I think it's uh, relevant. The future is more probably where we're going is companies now, major companies that want some sort of soil health principles to be utilized. I listed a few here. These are some I've been keeping track of that I literally have some sort of sustainability some sort of regenerative agriculture in, uh, in what they're trying to promote. You see a lot of big names there. It is something that's gonna make a difference. I've been working with Wrangler, Wrangler Jeans, and uh, they have now what they call rooted collection. Cotton that is used in this brand here was grown with no-till and cover crops. So much so that they actually took me over to Thessalonica, Greece a year ago to help launch this initiative in Greece. So. I'm just telling you some of the opportunities down the road. I know we're not all cotton farmers, but I just use that example. My challenge here as I wrap up is what is your story? You have a story. Is it something you wanna tell? What are you doing in your farm that counts toward a soil health practice? What might Cargill, ADM, or the big players, or whoever you market, or your local grain elevator, what might they be requiring in the years ahead? I don't know, but when you think about the next 10 years, where are you headed? Will the market get you there? I think it might. Be prepared. Will you seize these soil health opportunities or maybe you'll become obsolete? I'm sharing this not so much as a warning, but just a heads up. Where is agriculture headed? I think it's definitely to this more regenerative agriculture, whatever you want to call it, less tillage, more cover crops, more diversity. Um, little plug here for the book I just uh, wrote, The Future Proof Farm. Um, I will go into much more detail about some of the things I shared here today. 
pick it up at stevegroff.com. If you're interested, um, it just uh, we just went to the second printing, so it's it's selling pretty well. It's kind of a resource that you can use. I believe soil health is our future. This is me showing my granddaughter her first earthworm, and uh, just as a as a as a grandpa now, being able to do that was quite an emotional experience. Um, so uh, just to see her uh, enjoying that earthworm was really cool. So I'm gonna just uh, stop right there. And Jen, um, I'm not sure if you have a poll question to ask now, but uh, looking forward to sharing a little bit more uh, tomorrow. Uh, you can see some of the things outlined beforehand. So, um, so Jen, turn it back to you. Okay. Well, I think what I'd like to do is probably get through a few of the questions that have come through in the Q&A. Um, and so one of the first ones that we have is, does long-term use of tillage radish affect soil pH? So um, I don't know that it does. Uh, I would recommend you mix up your species. Uh, as I indicated earlier on, tillage radish um, or any radishes are out there with cover crops now is kind of the salt and pepper of, um, of a cover crop mix. And I just think that's wisdom. I don't have data to back it up. Um, there's, there's reasons we use radishes. Um, I have not heard it um, alter the pH. I don't know if, you're, if you experienced that or whoever's asked the question or not, but that is certainly not a, a common, um, I guess you'd say influence of radish, either increasing it or lowering it. I've not really heard um, that actually before, so. Let's see, I'm looking through. Um, how long would the farmer have to wait before cover crop planning and implementation impact drought and flooding issues? Um, well, that does depend on your soil uh, and your parent soil. There are, I will say there are definitely some soils that more quickly uh, will show a difference and show an improvement than others. Um, drought resistance, if you're in a dry land area, Sometimes it'll take longer, uh, maybe 10 years, because you just don't get enough moisture to grow cover crops. And I've been to Australia a couple of times, and their whole mentality is we got we to gotta build a bigger bucket, meaning their soil, to be able to catch every drop of water that falls in the sky and to hold it there. And in dry land areas, um, drought resilience takes a little longer, usually. Um, flooded areas, it depends, you know, if you have soil flooded, literally covered with water for days on end, it just, it kills biology. There's just no way around it. So if you, if that's typical in your area, you know, it's going to be a little, it's going to be a little tougher uh, to come around. Um, so there's, that's kind of, I mentioned extremes. So, you know, we're talking years. I would say people start noticing some substantive differences in three to five years is my general answer to that question. Okay. It looks like we have a couple of questions that have come through uh, related to a short planting window after yeah. harvest. And I think you'll probably address that again later on in the series. Yeah. Um, but just if you could touch on that now, that would be great. Yeah, it, it's again, that's a little difficult just to answer here in a question. And I totally get that, acknowledge that. You go further north and you're limited in growing degree days. And there you're going to have to get a little more creative. Uh, interseeding your cover crop at corn when it's knee high is an option. I'm just going to use uh, Interstate 80 in the United States. There in North, it seems to work. That's a viable option. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, there's relay cropping um, ideas that are being tested out there. Um, and you know, they're, they're, it, it's, it, it's not an easy answer to that. I mean, I talked to a guy from Florida once. He said, I don't have time to plant cover crops. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we're trying to triple crop. We want to grow three crops in a year. And I finally got him to, to say, well, there's the four week window of opportunity. It was a dairy farm between corn silage and something else. I said, why don't you grow sun hemp or cow peas during that four weeks? It's probably worth it. I hadn't thought of that. So the short planting window sometimes is just a, a, a simple fix, but I got to admit the farther north you go, the harder it is, um, at least with the current, um, you know, you know, things we know right now. Okay. Let's see, I'm looking maybe 
to have one more. Here's a, how much can cover crop speed up the transition to no-till? Well, I would say it's significant. I um, actually, people may su be surprised to hear me say this because I kind of come from a no-till perspective. That's kind of where I started, uh, you know, everything at where I'm at today. I would rather you see start with cover crops first, get your soil, I'll say in shape, uh, fertility wise, uh, leveled off, whatever. Uh, I, I then, then on the flip side, cover crops make no-till work. So, you know, if, if I would, let's just say if I would rent a neighbor's farm that had never been no-till before, I would absolutely, the first thing is get cover crops. It may not be ready for no-till the first year. So if you follow what my rationale is in there, I think cover crops actually do more for a soil than no-till does if you're gonna divide them up in two different sectors like that. So get your cover crop plan down. That's gonna make your no-till work better, quicker. Okay. Now I would say we have a lot of good questions that we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will hold on to these. Uh, and if there's ways that we can address them later on today or later on in the series, um, we will do that. Unless, you know, Lamont, I'll open this up to you as well. Just if there's any sort of burning question that um, that we should address or uh, if we move on to the, the panel discussion right now. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, how about you and I keep uh, combing through the questions and once we get the, the next panel started and uh, maybe if there's time, we can bring Steve back in and answer those additional questions. But I suspect we'll also get a lot of questions on the, on the panel as well. Yeah, I, I think we probably will too. Um, but we'll... Like I said, we'll see what we can do about the questions that we have that remain unanswered. Uh, but in the meantime, we do want to move on because we want to leave plenty of time for our panel discussion too. Um, so if it's okay, I'll go ahead and introduce people um, and and we'll start that off. Jen, Jen just quick, do, do I stop share now or can you do that? I don't think I can do that. Okay, I'm going to hit stop share. Okay, there we go. I think that is Lamont's jam. Let's see. I had, uh, okay. So let's see. We have uh, three panelists for this afternoon. Um, we have Jenna Mitchell is with uh, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. You're their Pennsylvania program director, right? Um, and also affiliated with uh, the Turkey Hill Partnership. We have Ryan Rogan Dewey with Campbell Soup Company and Eric Souter with Team Ag. So I'm going to take these folks in turn. I'm going to let Jenna start off to talk for a few minutes about the Turkey Hill Partnership. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I'm realizing, I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but I missed the gray button down memo. Steve, Eric, and Ryan all have gray button downs. <laughs> Um, all right, so let me get started here. And thank you so much. It's always so inspiring to hear Steve speak. So I'm, I'm so honored to, you know, to join you all today and also to follow Steve. Um, so while I go into present mode. There we go. Um, so my name is Jenna Mitchell and I'm the Pennsylvania State Director at the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, for those of you that might not be familiar with the Alliance, our mission is to um, you know, protect and restore the rivers and streams that flow into the Chesapeake Bay by working with communities, companies, and conservationists. Um, so I'm really excited today to share the story about two companies um, that we've built this wonderful partnership with. Um, the Alliance has our headquarters in Annapolis. I work out of the Pennsylvania office, which is located in Lancaster. And then we also have an office in Richmond, Virginia, and in DC as well. So today we're gonna to talk about Pennsylvania, obviously. Um, this map might be familiar to some of you. This is the map of all of the impaired streams in Pennsylvania. And by far my favorite way to describe an impaired stream is something that I've learned at Stroud, um, Stroud Water Research Center, which is 
really that, you know, 70% of the life that should be in that stream no longer, um, you know, can, can survive in that stream. Um, and the metaphor that they use is the canary in the coal mine, you know, 70% of our canaries are gone. Um, and all of the red on this map, um, you know, is, is considered impaired. And so we've got some serious, serious work to do in Pennsylvania. And we were sharing this work at a business forum um, that the Alliance had held. And um, if you focus in on, so Lancaster County, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but Lancaster County is in South Central Pennsylvania. I'm sure many of you are familiar. And you know, almost all of our streams are impaired, significant maturity impaired. And that caught um, the attention of the former CEO of, of Turkey Hill Dairy. And he said to the Alliance, you know, if there's anything that we can do to make a difference here, let us know. And so, of course, we wanted to take full advantage of that opportunity and started conversations with, with uh, John Cox, the former CEO of Turkey Hill. And that led to um, this, this wonderful partnership and this, um, you know, this opportunity for Turkey Hill to really think about how they can make a difference. And um, Turkey Hill's you know, through the various conversations that we had with them, they decided that the, that what they wanted to do, the steps they wanted to take was to actually require that 100% of the farms that supply milk to Turkey Hill, both get a conservation plan and implement that conservation plan. And timing couldn't have worked out any better about four years ago when we started this conversation, it was right when Turkey Hill was rebidding the contract for which dairy co-op would supply milk to, um, to provide all of the milk for the Turkey Hill ice cream that we all know and love. And Maryland, Virginia, Milk Producers Cooperative Association, who for the rest of the presentation I'll refer to as just Maryland, Virginia. Um, and I'm sorry if you guys can see this panel, let me move that too. Um, but uh, so anyway, Maryland, Virginia co-op responded very, very favorably in, in January of 2018. We sat down um, with Turkey Hill, Maryland, Virginia Co-op and created what we now call the Turkey Hill Clean Water Partnership. And, you know, this, this need to have a conservation plan is, I mean, I, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a conservation plan um, and likely also familiar that only 50% of farms, it's estimated, have that conservation plan. And then you're also very familiar with the fact that many of our farmers um, in South Central Pennsylvania are plain sect. They're, you know, at times comfortable, but sometimes uncomfortable engaging with the government. And for Turkey Hill to step up and, and really serve as a leader in this way, presented an opportunity to engage on a, on a deeper level <clears throat> with our plain sect farmers. And then additionally, Maryland Virginia Co-op, um, a benefit that we very quickly realized is that they have wonderful relationships with their farmers, some of which they've worked with, with you know, over a decade or many decades in some cases um, as, as members of their co-op. So, um, Again, uh, you know, the first and foremost goal that we created together was to get all of our farmers conservation plans. And a, a big commitment that came from Turkey Hill was that once these farmers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, once these farmers got that conservation plan um, and started making steps towards implementation of that conservation plan, Turkey Hill would begin to actually pay a premium for this added sustainability. So just as Steve was talking about, you know, this is something that companies are paying attention to and even better, they're starting to pay for, um, which is again, just so exciting to see <clears throat> in Lancaster County where, you know, something like this, especially for our dairy farmers is very, very needed. Um, oh, I'm not sure what that was. Um, and so now this partnership has been active for over three years and we're hopeful that it's a model that um, continues to inspire action throughout the industry. Um, so just taking a step back, you know, from Turkey Hill's perspective, you know, why, why was this a priority to them? Um, number one, just as, as Steve was hitting on, they have a deep commitment to sustainability um, and, you know, being a responsible corporation. Um, they actually are 100% renewable energy right now through some various um, different partnerships that they have as well. So this was just a sort of added opportunity um, in their sustainability portfolio. And then they're also really um, committed to becoming a change agent and providing, um, you know, any type of incentive or, or really any opportunity to be a leader in the world. In, I mean, in the, in the region, in the country, and potentially in the world as well. Um, so, 
Additionally, for Turkey Hill, this is certainly something that they see as a as something that they can benefit from as well. So it's a point of differentiation from some of their competitors. Um, it's a way to engage their consumers and you know really build some identity within their brand. And they're also very very committed that this goes beyond greenwashing. So there's you know absolute action steps that they want us to be taking on the ground and that we are taking um, and a long-term commitment from them that this isn't something that they just want to do as sort of a short six month, you know, nice project to, to continue to recycle and share the story of, but really something that is going to make a lasting commitment. And again, they have made that monetary commitment that as, you know, progress is made that Turkey Hill, you know, will pay for that progress. Um, so, as you can imagine, both conservation and ice cream are a very fun thing to market together. So we have had a ton of fun creating different catchphrases and different, you know, fun um, things to, to share. Um, our catchphrase for the partnership is I scream, you scream, we all scream for clean streams. And that has turned into different stickers and brochures and um, backdrops. Um, and then we short shorten it here to, you can see ice cream for clean streams. I'm wondering if we need to trademark that um, to, to really keep it for the partnership. Um, but we have you know, been all around the country and are really trying to build you know, a strong national communications plan to get this story out there. And then additionally, um, you know, I mentioned the role of Maryland Virginia Co-op. Um, one of the first hurdles in the partnership was figuring out how we're going to communicate this to the farmers. And again, it was absolutely wonderful that Maryland Virginia Co-op had existing relationships with all of their farmers. And the first step that we took was training all of the Maryland Virginia field staff and we figured that the field staff would sort of be the, um, you know, the front lines of the partnership. We realized a little bit through that, that, um, you know, probably about six months in that that was a little bit too much to put on the plate of the field staff. So one of the greatest, um, greatest opportunities that have evolved out of this partnership is that Maryland Virginia now has a sustainability team um, specifically committed to serving their farmers sustainability goals. And so that, um, you know, we still work very closely with the field staff, but the folks that really drive, um, you know, the partnership forward alongside of, you know, the Alliance team that works on the ground with our farmers is the Maryland Virginia sustainability team. And so um, in addition to that, Maryland Virginia plays a wonderful role in, you know, really thinking through how we can build this, you know, this model throughout the conservation community um, and really thinks through, you know, what are all of the aspects of, of truly building a sustainable supply chain and they really lead us in that effort. Um, so just to um, explain sort of how this, you know, really built out um, from step one. There was over 350 farm visits um, to get us started and really understanding, you know, how many of our farms do have that conservation plan? How many of them are fully implementing, you know, what's written into that plan? How many, you know, are implementing soil health practices? Who has um, a manure storage? Is that manure storage adequate? Um, and so we did a lot of, you know, just diving into figuring out what things looked like on the ground so that we could start to build some of our goals and, and know what our priorities were. Um, so at the start, we found that about 60% of farms um, had a conservation plan, which was, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit above what, what we figured the regional average was. So that was nice. And um, one additional um, one additional wonderful thing that, that Turkey Hill really asked for when this partnership was developing is that when Maryland Virginia responded to this bid, they said, you know, we can make sure that any farmer right now um, that is serving, supplying to Turkey Hill has a conservation plan. And Turkey Hill said, no, you know, we still want the best milk that you can give us within, you know, a 50 mile radius. And let's work together to use this as an opportunity to get those that don't have a plan, a conservation plan. And so what we then see with the fact that about 60% of the farms did have a conservation plan once we got started is that there may be a correlation between having a higher quality milk and having, you know, conservation implemented on the farm. Um, and so 
as of fall of 2020, 95% of our farms had a conservation plan. And then for anyone who works in dairy knows that end of fall gets crazy because it's eggnog season. And so the numbers between Turkey Hill's growth and eggnog season, numbers jumped up to 230 farmers supplying to Turkey Hill. And um, now we're right down around like 70, between 70 and 80% of farmers having a conservation plan. But that just means we have an opportunity to help even more farmers get that conservation plan and implement the practices within that plan. Um, and so we are seeing continued growth and we expect to you know, keep moving forward with that growth. Um, so then, of course, once we get plans, um, you know, a lot of this past year has been focusing on implementation of those plans. And so at the end of last year, we had 22 projects on member farms with over $725,000 committed. Um, and now we're really working off of a, we have a wait list of farms, of farmers that are calling the sustainability team. Um, you know, at this point, we don't even really need to do outreach to the farmers. There's farmers that are reaching out, asking for support. Um, and we're really just trying to figure out how to keep bringing funding in and, and access and leverage available funding from, from public resources. Um, so just some quick numbers. Oh, and this is, um, I apologize that I didn't update some of these numbers, um, but we have 230 farms now shipping to Turkey Hill. Um, that number has dropped to in between 70 and 80 farms having conservation plans. And we have about $2 million in grants um, for implementation from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And then we, um, we put in as much work as we can to make sure that we're leveraging that fund, those funds with funds like PenVest, Equip, um, and other you know different opportunities um, publicly. These are some um, pictures of, of work that we've done. Um, so certainly, you know, there's a big focus on putting buffers in, um, riparian forest buffers, installing riparian forest buffers as, as you know, where opportunities exist to do so, um, you know, putting in walkways and um, we put in a lot of manure storage facilities and also stabilized barnyards. Um, you know, we, we, I would estimate that about 90% of the farms that we work with are plain sect and there's some pretty serious headquarters needs um, when it comes to working with those farmers. Here are, here's another manure storage. And then we also, um, when we can, when there's not, um, you know, global pandemics limiting us, um, we try to get the whole Turkey, Til Turkey Hill and Maryland, Virginia and Alliance teams um, out to plant trees. Um, you can see me here making sort of a weird face with that tiny little hat on. Um, but this is folks from the marketing team at Turkey Hill. And then uh, the woman in the purple wool hat right here is Janae. She's actually the, um, the manager of the sustainability team at Maryland, Virginia co-op. Um, and then we were honored this year, um, this past year, we actually received an award from um, the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy as um, an outstanding supply chain collaboration partnership. So that was given to um, Turkey Hill Dairy, Maryland, Virginia, and the Alliance for um, the Turkey Hill Clean Water Partnership. Um, and again, just a testament to, um, you know, how much we really, really hope that this this model between the co-op, the dairy distributor, and the nonprofit is something that can be replicated throughout the country. Um, and then if you're interested in learning more, um, these are all of our different social media handles. And um, we would be um, you know, happy to connect or um, you know, follow up with, with anyone who's interested. Okay, so uh, we have a few questions that have come in and I'm gonna stick to the ones for now that are sort of specific to, to this Turkey Hill partnership. Um, so one is, uh, has to do with plain sect farmers from Shord uh, and whether or not, um, you know, with them being reluctant to accept government subsidies, you know, was this something, was this a model that, um, that they could hook onto that was popular with them? Yeah, so that's one of the greatest benefits in, in our opinion that the plain sect farmers respond very positively when the folks that are purchasing milk from them are the ones that are asking for this. Um, you know, to go back to, you know, Steve's book, you know, the chapter on, you know, the sort of millennial mom being your boss, I think, I think our plain sect farmers are, are certainly understanding that and it, 
I think that they're much more responsive to the market asking for something than the government mandating it. Okay. Let's see. Uh, another one that's specific, I think, to you is, does Turkey Hill offer a buyer's premium for products grown under conservation practices? So I, they, I'm not honestly sure what a buyer's premium is, but there is a premium that Turkey Hill pays per hundred weight for the milk that they're purchasing from Maryland Virginia Co-op. Um, if that is, I imagine that that is exactly what a buyer's premium is. I've just never heard it used in, in exactly that way, but I think the answer is yes, they do. I understand. Um, I was hoping you knew what that terminology was. It was new to me as well. <laughs> Okay, um, and Richard, I see that you have a comment in there as well. That was one that I was going to hold on uh, until the end of the panel, um, because I think it applies to more than one of our presentations. So uh, with that, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ryan from Campbell's. Um, and just, you know, I'm hoping uh, for all the technical advisors that are on here, um, that these examples of corporate sustainability efforts, um, you know, kind of get your uh, your thinking going as far as uh, opportunities that are available to you, uh, the kinds of things that are, are are showing up as opportunities for the farmers that you work with, and how we can move uh, to, or how we can work to help move these these efforts forward. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ryan. All right, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Rogan Dewey. I'm uh, on the sustainable agriculture team at Campbell Soup Company. We have our headquarters um, in the Chesapeake Bay area in Camden, New Jersey and plants in the area. Um, and this afternoon, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some background on our sustainable agriculture work at Campbell, um, especially within our wheat supply chain, um, which very much, uh, which is which most touches on the Chesapeake Bay area. And then I'm going to add an additional lens to try and um, talk a little bit about uh, the role of cover crops in this program and, and just how Campbell sees those. Um, first, I want to provide a little bit more background on Campbell and, and kind of our corporate perspective. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, just a couple of years ago, Campbell celebrated its 150th anniversary, which today would make us about 152 years old. And one strand in our corporate history that a lot of us are very proud of, I certainly am, is our close relationship with, uh, with agriculture, which actually dates back to our very beginnings. Um, for example, from this photo in 186, from 1869, or um, sorry, this photo isn't quite there yet, but before this photo, in 1869, when we were founded, um, our, our namesake, Joseph Candle, actually got his start working with uh, New Jersey tomato growers as a, as a wholesaler. Uh, now, fast forwarding into 1914, looking at this photo, uh, Dr. John Dorrance became Campbell's third president. And in the following decades, he and his wife hosted annual grower meetings uh, at their home, on, which was also the, the, the corporate um, uh, the corporate fam the, the corporate farm um, with and, and there was a gathering every year such as what such as what you see here and this is this is a story in a photo that I love to share at gatherings at other ag gatherings like this um, and I think it really tells a lot about um, our legacy um, today our founders traditions and values are embodied in our corporate purpose which is real food that ladder that matters for life's moments. Uh, we define real food at Campbell as food that we're proud to serve because it has roots in the ground, it's prepared with care, and is accessible to all. And underlining all these uh, values, there is a transparency that builds trust with our customers and our consumers. Um, sustainable agriculture and the other pillars of our corporate responsibility and sustainability strategy ladder up to these values. Now we live out our real food philosophy as a company and also through our family of many brands. Half of this family of brands uh, includes many iconic meals and beverage uh, names that you would know. And then the other half, um, which, which maybe fewer people know about is a family, a robust family of snack brands. Um, in fact, we're the third largest snacking company in the US 
And uh, these snack brands include many wheat-based snack products, such as Pepper, Pepperidge Farm Bakery Classics, Pepperidge Farm Cookies, uh, such as Farmhouse and Milano, Goldfish Crackers, of course, uh, Snyder's Hanover Pretzels, Snack Factory Pretzel Crisps, um, and Lance Sandwich Crackers. So given the prominence of wheat um, in our, for our company, and especially in these great brands that I just mentioned, and just the large volumes that we source, in 2017, uh, we made wheat a priority ingredient uh, for our corporate sustainable ag program. So the goal of this program, the sustainable ag program that we have, is to protect natural resources and farm livelihoods. And we, we do it through four focus areas that you see here. Um, we accomplish this goal through an approach that includes providing support and technology for our prior priority ingredients, such as wheat. Uh, managing programs for growers of these crops and working with our brands and our corporate communications teams to do farm story, farm and sustainability storytelling uh, to our many diverse stakeholders. Um, focusing now in on our wheat program, uh, this is a bit of an overview. Um, we initially started this program um, from a, a goal that we made in 2015 to source or to enroll 70,000 acres, uh, wheat acres, um, into a fertilizer optimi optimization plan by 2020. Uh, in 2018, we expanded our commitment uh, to sustainably source 50% of our wheat volume. And that's the active commitment that we have today for wheat. And to accomplish these goals, um, years ago, we, we began collaborating with Land Lakes Jutera and the Environmental Defense Fund as they developed a data analytics tool called the Chutera Insights Engine. This tool helps farmers to advance their environmental stewardship acre by acre and to see the financial return on their sustainability investments. Chutera, um, the Chutera partnership leverages um, Land O'Lakes nationwide network of ag retailers. As trusted advisors to farmers, these retailers are ideally positioned to deploy the Insights Engine and also to deliver expert advice on each field and to facilitate flows of information um, between farmers and others in the value chain, such as Campbell. So in 2017, uh, as you see here on the right, we launched the first phase of our wheat sustainability program in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So it was our original pilot area, um, specifically in Maryland and Pennsylvania in partnership with a local ag retailer called The Mill. Um, and today we have about 10,000, just over 10,000 acres enrolled there. In 2019, we began collaborating with Heritage Cooperative, uh, another ag retailer, to launch a similar effort in Ohio, which is another uh, important sourcing region for Campbell. And I mentioned earlier that in the Chesapeake Bay area, we have uh, three, actually three plant uh, snack plants um, that are important for us. And that, so that was the, the rationale uh, for the original choice of Chesapeake Bay to get started. So with these partnerships, uh, last year we completed uh, that first 70,000 acre goal that I that I that I mentioned just a minute ago, and we continue to make steady progress to, towards our our bigger commitment, sourcing 50% of wheat um, from a sustainable ag program. Um, however, acreage and simple acreage enrollment in the program is is only the start. Uh, continuous improvement is the goal for us, and for the first time last year, we were able to compare year on year results from our Chesapeake Bay project area, and specifically on the wheat farms, the wheat fields there. So while the adoption of conservation practices and their outcomes, um, as you know, does need to be tracked over a longer period of time, which is two years to assess impact, um, these two years of worth of results do uh, show some encouraging uh, results and suggest some progress in the Chesapeake Bay area. Um, for example, um, what, for example, uh, we saw improvements here in, in nutrient management, um, reductions in uh, on-farm greenhouse gas emissions, and also reduction in soil erosion. And of course, cover crops and reduced tillage um, as, as practices contribute to all these outcomes. Um, for cover crops uh, in this area, we have about 50% 50, 50 of acres covered, um, benefiting from cover crops. Um, a higher adoption rate for conservation tillage, um, and in fact, 95% of the acres that we work with um, use no-till. Uh, 
Um, so one of the priorities that we have identified from Trutera data such as this is to drive adoption of cover crops in our wheat supply chain. Um, at Campbell and as a partnership, we see this as a great opportunity first because of the important positive impacts that cover crops have on ecosystem services, especially in conjunction with, with other regenerative farming practices. Uh, Steve mentioned just a few minutes ago, such as reduced tillage. Um, these impacts include, as you all know, uh, first the protection of water sheds, sheds, such as the Chesapeake Bay, by improving soil water holding capacity, reducing erosion, um, also enhancing soil health and its, its potential to sequester carbon, responsible pest management, and not least uh, in strengthening farm livelihoods by uh, reducing costs and improving resilience to extreme weather events. From the Campbell perspective, um, as a company that takes its corporate citizenship uh, seriously, each of these outcomes uh, has intrinsic importance to us. Um, additionally, supporting regenerative farming practices such as cover crops just also makes good business sense. For example, a more productive and more resilient wheat farms in our supply uh, in our supply areas should translate to more resilient wheat supply uh, wheat supply chains for Campbell. Uh, there's also an opportunity to better connect with the next generation of food consumers. Among this demographic, uh, a company's support of cover crops specifically and also reduced tillage is increasingly becoming an indicator of its support for regenerative agriculture in general. Um, and regenerative ag is increasingly being seen as, as the next step in sustainable ag. So for some of our brands, um, having cover crops adopted within our supply chains is an opportunity for brand value, increased brand value, and also just creating connections with, with some of these consumers. So there's obvious value in practices such as cover crops, but how does our program encourage these practices? Um, our approach is grounded, our program approach is grounded in, in three unique pillars uh, that I like to think about. Um, I've already discussed two of these. Um, one is the insights engine, which is the core technology of the Jutera model. Um, a second pillar is our ag retailers. They're on the bottom left who are kind of our expert um, uh, expert boots on the ground working directly with farmers. A third pillar is the diversity of partnerships up at the top that we layer on, um, that, that allow us to layer on resources and incentives uh, for the farmers that we work with. So based on these capabilities, we can encourage cover crops as part of a sustainable crop system in a few key ways. Um, the first is that the Insights Engine uh, is able to estimate for growers, model for growers, the impacts of cover crops on financial profitability, on soil erosion, on greenhouse gas emissions, and on soil organic matter trends. Now, these impacts are modeled at a subfield level, and you can you can get a, a sense for that in these maps um, in, in the upper right-hand corner there, um, which shows some of the simulated impacts of, of adopting cover crops and other practices for a farmer. Um, and, th and this modeling allows growers to get a better sense for the full costs and benefits of um, practices such as cover crops. Second, when the growers uh, run crop, crop plan scenarios uh, that include cover crops, the Insights Engine flags for them state, federal, and other incentives that they could qualify for, and even provides guidance on how to apply for those programs. Um, the, the robust Maryland, Maryland State um, Cover Crop Cost Share Program is just one example of these, uh, and that is, that's, that's encouraged adoption in this area. Um, once an incentive opportunity is identified, growers can use the data that they that they house, that they store in the Chutera Insights Engine to go and apply for those programs. Third, our ag retailer partners combine Insights Engine's capabilities with their own personal understanding of each grower's fields and operations to encourage adoption. In the case of the Chesapeake Bay, specifically, our partner, the mill, has over 15 years of experience engaging farmers on cover crops through test plots, advisory services, seed sales, and also offering broadcast applications. So that's also an important um, tactic to encourage cover crops. Um, here on, on my last slide, I wanted to just share some priorities going forward. Um, you know, despite some of, some of this encouraging information that, that I've just shared, um, at the same time, we recognize that there's a long way still to go. Um, here, our partners have 
here on the left, our partners have shared some challenges um, in advancing cover crop adoption in the Chesapeake Bay area. Um, you know, I, I recognize that I'm speaking with many um, soil and agronomy experts, so none of this is probably new to you, and these are very much illustrative, but one example is uh, that ideal cover crop planting and termination times in the fall and spring, respectively, uh, coincide with some of the busiest times of the year for a farm. So there's a there's consequently a competition for uh, a grower's uh, resources and time at crucial moments. Also, for growers who do plant cover crops, um, they are most likely to use wheat or another cereal cover crop. Um, in our case, in the case of our acres, about 99% of the time. Um, because they're more familiar with and with these cover crops and the seed is available instead of optimizing for more with with more um, diverse mixes. Um, so, and finally, because Campbell recognizes the importance of cover crops, um, we are currently planning to initiate with our Truterra partners new actions that address some of these challenges and, mm -hmm. and accelerate adoption. This year, we're scoping out potential opportunities to do this. Um, an obvious opportunity for us is to continue identifying new incentives programs and to bring those to growers through the Insights engine. We also see an opportunity to partner with cover crop seed companies to provide subsidized seed to growers, in addition to technical support and uh, marketing collateral for our ag retailers. Um, also, um, we're looking at building the capacity of our ag retailers um, as another pillar. Possibilities include um, providing specialized cover crop training, um, helping to co-fund conservation agronomist positions within their businesses and encouraging investments in new cover crop related services. Finally, the Insights Engine already provides recommendations and leads to our ag retailers on individualized uh, sales opportunities. And this is also um, something that um, we're constantly enhancing. Um, and you can get a picture of that there on the bottom right-hand corner, what, what an ag retailer might see in terms of business leads. So at this point, we're, we're whiteboarding ideas such as this, so I'd be eager to hear any, any feedback that any of you might have or any suggestions. Um, and with that, I'll just thank you for your time. If any of you are interested in more information or in learning how to collaborate with our Wheat Burke and Chesapeake Play, feel free to contact me at this uh, address here. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. That was a lot of really good information and a, a neat program. Uh, I'm looking through to see, um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end for everyone. Um, but one question that I see is whether or not you've noticed or if you guys are tracking any difference in nutritional value um, in um, wheat that is grown by you know, these more sustainable practices? That's a great question. Um, at, the, at the Campbell level, we're not. Um, it's something that we're interested in and we're following the technologies that are emerging that would allow us to do this, which are very nascent at this point. But, um, you know, consumers, um, one, one perspective is that our consumers are not yet um, asking for this kind of information. And so, we're not quite there yet on the consumer end. Um, at the Campbell end, we see this as, as something that will probably be increasingly important. Um, I don't know if, um, I don't know at, at the Tritera level or at the Ag Retailer level if some of them are doing this, but we don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, so other questions that are, that are good, I'm gonna hold on to again until the end uh, when we have a chance to, to talk with all three. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I gave Eric sufficient time uh, to, to talk here as well, um, because he comes from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, they, you know, Ryan and Jenna are, are looking, uh, are working with specific companies and Eric is um, coming from, I think, sort of a technical service provider perspective and is tied into a lot of innovative efforts um, that, that connect economy and, and these, uh, these practices. So I'm gonna turn it over to him and hopefully we have plenty of time for questions at the end because these are really good ones. Awesome, thanks Jen and hello everybody. Um, so like she said, my name is Eric Souter and I work with a company called Team Ag here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. 
Um, and we work to help farmers improve their environmental and economic performance. And we do that through our engineering and land planning services and work really closely with Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay in a lot of that work, um, but also in crop consulting and agricultural planning and permitting. Um, so I came to Team Ag actually about four years ago, um, motivated by mm -hmm. a book called Drawdown and Climate Change Impacts. And um, here you can see some of the array of uh, solutions that they outline, but one of the things that I really took away from that was um, that 12 of the top 20 of these solutions are agricultural and, uh, and land and food based. Um, and so to me that just said, you know, agriculture needs to be really at the center of this kind of work. Um, I always like to show this photo. It's from a company called Climeworks that does direct air capture. Um, and I think this shows how desperate uh, the problem is. You know, this is technology to basically mechanically pull CO2 out of the air. Um, I, I think we need to invest in stuff like this, but think how much easier it is to scale photosynthesis. And I, I think it helps to frame how we need to be doing everything possible within ag as fast as we can to limit the need for this kind of technology. So today I wanna to talk about these different incentives that are emerging for regenerative agriculture. And some of those are in ecosystem services, also in brand commitments like uh, Jenna and Ryan were talking about today, and finally in transition tools. So starting off with ecosystem services, so regenerative agriculture is really restoring life to degraded ecosystems. And so instead of just, um, instead of degrading or even sustaining ecosystem carrying capacity, we're looking at building soils and cleaning water and increasing biodiversity and emerging markets for these ecosystem services recognize this contribution. So if you're a regenerative farmer, you're really thinking about having a whole new set of crops or these ecosystem services. Um, that you're looking to cultivate. So a few companies that are emerging here are, are like Nori. Um, Nori is developing the protocols to verify carbon sequestration and compensate farmers for that work. So they're basically making that match and being able to show that yes, this is, um, this is the amount of CO2 that was sequestered through these processes. Um, and so far, this is a voluntary marketplace, and it's driven by companies like Microsoft here. Um, they made a big statement to be carbon negative by 2030, but also to remove all of their historic emissions um, by 2050. So these types of um, corporate leaders are, are really the driver for these types of emerging marketplaces. But it's not just carbon either. And that's why I've been uh, fascinated by this group called Regen Network, which is really working to define the ecological state protocols that would be the basis for what they're calling ecological contracts that would guide real world changes of state. So if you can imagine an initial degraded state and uh, what it would change to, um, but instead of just being in, uh, in carbon-based things like no-till cover cropping or, or rotational grazing, they're also bringing in opportunities uh, in the future for riparian habitats that would um, be more focused on sediment or nutrients or even other indicators like uh, pollinator density, um, which are more of a biological impact. So the takeaway here is that um, the potential for ecosystem services is really vast. Um, one of the questions that I think comes up here is what kind of scale is necessary for a farmer to be in, involved in this? And it really depends on the cost to register and verify those projects uh, versus the value of the, the service. Um, there's lots of remote sensing tools that are making this cheaper, uh, as well as um, the different data and record keeping that you have. Um, and, and where does it make the most sense? Um, quite honestly, uh, a lot of it, a lot of these large, um, big acreage, low adoption places, like this is a, an image from Indigo Ag that estimates uh, cover crop cropping adoption in central Iowa 
Um, so you can see here, if you're a, a cover cropping farmer in Iowa, you're kind of lonely. Um, but uh, the same stuff also makes sense here in our context in Pennsylvania. Um, I used uh, Model My Watershed uh, from Stroud here to take a look at uh, sediment, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus reductions for just a sample 100 acre farm. Uh, and then also used a tool called Comet uh, Planner um, from USDA to look at carbon. Um, and uh, you know these are these are sizable contributions from a, sh a shift uh, of just 100 acres to no-till and cover cropping. Um, and uh, one of the questions I would expect here. Um, that's central to all of this uh, with carbon is what's the, the value of a, a ton of carbon. Um, and it ranges quite a bit. Nori is trading right now at $15 a ton. So for this 100 acre farm, that would be about $2,400 per year, um, you know, which is a, a significant extra piece of, of revenue. But there's also a smaller, much more story based. Um, emerging carbon marketplaces where that value could be as high as $100 per ton. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that emerges and where it lands. Um, but it is a real value at aggregate too. I did an analysis for the total amount of carbon that could be sequestered in Pennsylvania. And here it was 84 million at uh, $15 a ton which is really strikingly similar to the amount of annual agricultural subsidies in Pennsylvania. Um, I'll spend just a little bit of time in brand commitments because Jen and Ryan already covered this so well, um, but Team Ag is increasingly getting calls from in industry that are interested in, in how to deepen their involvement in regenerative ag. Um, here is a, a pledge from US Dairy uh, on Earth Day last year to um, move dairy emissions in the US to net zero carbon by 2050. Um, so this is just really wild stuff. Um, and we're still figuring out how those kind of commitments can be made, or, uh, how they can be met. Um, one of uh, another example of a really interesting brand that's moving things forward here um, is called Origin Milk. It's regenerative grass fed A2 Guernsey and heritage breed cows. Um, they operate in Pennsylvania, Colorado, and, uh, and Ohio, um, but they're paying farmers $40 a hundredweight for regenerative milk. Um, and this offers um, the signal that the consumers are committed to ecological regeneration, um, and it can really change the game for uh, farmers and agricultural communities. Um, and I think if we offer proper support to farmers, we can see conservation returns as a result. So I, finally, I want to talk about some of these transition tools. Um, one is uh, just a really creative thing called the Perennial Fund, where they um, provide capital so farmers don't lose profit through a transition to organic and, and regenerative practices. Um, and also back that up with the knowledge and support to help farmers um, transition to access ecosystem service marketplaces and premium pricing. And if they can't help the farmer through all of that repay the loan, then it's forgiven. And I think these types of bold examples of sharing risk um, are, are really important as potential future models for uh, conservation finance. At Team Ag, we've also been working um, to develop a regenerative farm business plan that helps farmers to transition to regenerative ag. Um, we really wanted to know how do we benchmark farms and how do we help identify regeneration opportunities at the farm level, um, help farmers gain new economic clarity around these decisions and access new markets. Um, we've been piloting that work across 11 farms in Pennsylvania, thanks to a, a grant from the PA Department of Agriculture, um, and also through some funding from PA NRCS. Um, this is really focused on soil health, but also management of crops and, and animals and manure um, and seeing its impact on water quality, biodiversity, energy, and farm economics. Um, and some of the, the anticipated uh, outcomes that we're seeing for farmers are improved soil health, decreasing cost of inputs and use energy, uh, diversifying their revenue streams and accessing premium pricing for regenerative products. So where are we now with all of this work as a society? 
Um, first, I'm excited that regenerative ag embodies this deep connection between agriculture and conservation. And there are many new opportunities emerging right now that have real financial impacts in brands, conservation organizations, lenders, and governments can be um, really important in these transitions too. So um, a couple of recommendations are um, to think about what some of the requirements are for the markets or certifications that you might be pursuing. Um, take a look at the Regenerative Organic Alliance, uh, the ROC certification, um, some of the inputs in tools like Comet Farm that would help you to measure that. Um, but then also pay attention to farm records. Um, this is gonna be really important um, to be able to make these certifications um, and, and use them to be able to observe trends. What's happening on your farm or the farms that you're working with? Are these important metrics trending upwards or are they stagnant? Um, and use them to help set goals. You know, where do you wanna be with this farm? What would you like to achieve and what, what steps could you take to do that. So um, it's a high level intro um, to a lot of the different things that are emerging right now, um, but happy to take any questions with it. Okay, so while people are thinking of questions specific to your presentation, there's there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of people that are kind of digging at the same question right now, it looks like, which is great. Um, I, I wanted to get back to maybe a couple of the other questions that we had had come through. Um, in terms of, uh, are you for, I think this is for uh, Ryan and maybe Jenna, you know, are you looking at other crops? I think the question was specific about tomatoes with Campbell's, but, you know, I think it's broader, um, you know, if you're looking at other uh, items in your supply chain. I could start. Um, I was, I was amiss to not mention our other uh, sustainable ag priority ingredients. Um, our very first, the very first one that we began working with, you wouldn't be surprised is with tomatoes. They're all grown out in California these days. Um, we also have programs for potatoes and um, are looking at uh, a couple new ingredients uh, beginning this year. Um, so, yeah, we, we do that kind of sustainable ag goal and focus area slide that I shared um, kind of captures um, generally what we're doing across all of these ingredients. And, you know, we do with all of them, we have a soil health lens. Um, some biodiversity, responsible pest management lens, water conservation lens. Um, but of course, for every ingredient and region, the, the, the approach is going to be different um, to, to be appropriate to, to that context. So um, that's the quick answer to that. Okay. And the Alliance is looking at um, and having conversations with the poultry industry. So we um, potentially this year will hopefully be breaking ground on um, some work on poultry farms. And they, we do have various conversations ongoing with other dairy partners. Um, and specifically one of them is organic, um, sort of a different product. Okay. Um, I think we had a question in there that wanted to get a little more detail or maybe think of it in a different way as far as the the incentives that you're offering to farmers. Um, you know, I heard a few things from from Jenna that you that Turkey Hill is offering a premium specifically to to suppliers who have uh, soil and water conservation plans. Um, Ryan, I heard from you that you're providing a service uh, in that ag assistance uh, to support the Tutera model and running that um, and finding incentives on farms, but um, would you say kind of generally, are you more pointing people towards like government resources for paying for conservation practices or, or sort of how do all of those incentives fit in together? I can start. Uh, yeah, for, no, go ahead, Jenna. So we, um, that premium supports, it does support farmers in implementing the sustainability practices. Um, but it's not enough to, I mean, we need millions and millions and millions of dollars to support, to support, 
you know, just the 230 dairy farmers that ship to Turkey Hill. Um, so we do try to take full access or um, full advantage of public funds. And then we also have been trying to seek, um, you know, different foundation opportunities to bring to the table as well. Um, so it's, it's sort of a little bit of, of everything or a lot of everything really. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, so, you know, we're aligned that, that providing um, that, that financial incentives are essential um, for a lot of farms adopting these practices for the first time, and even those that, that want to scale up across other acres in their farms. Um, we're also very cognizant that there are lots of resources out there and oftentimes barriers to applying for those. And um, so our focus so far has been uh, reducing those kind of data and other facilitation barriers that um, farmers have in front of them to apply for those programs. Sometimes it's just awareness. Um, at the same time, we've been looking at other leverage points. We haven't, um, we're, we're open to providing um, direct incentives, but haven't done that yet. And at the same time, we're, we're just looking at the lever, the other leverage points to see where we might be able to have the most impact. And some of those possibilities that I mentioned on that last slide, like maybe building out the ag retailer's capacity to offer uh, better um, regenerative cover crop related services might be a bigger leverage point for, for a single actor like Campbell to play. Okay, Thanks. I think one of the, it could be a good time to pull in Richard's question from before about your, your statement saying that um, some of these marketplace price premiums are relatively short lived yeah. and it eventually becomes the standard price. My hope is that with some of the regenerative work that's really focused on building a more resilient farm and working to build the soils on the farm, that um, what we're looking to do through some of these transitions can be a bit deeper than just a box check kind of thing um, where a, a farmer clears another hurdle. Because we really don't want this to be a thing where farmers just have to jump higher you know, uh, and I think they've often felt like that in, in, in the past. Um, my hope is that in these transitions, they're really left with a farm that is more profitable for them. Um, and I also do hope that uh, in as many opportunities as we can, they come with, with price premiums. They do get more for what they're growing um, as brands are able to charge that. Yeah, I've been I've been looking at Richard's comment there as well, um, with the idea that the price premiums are short lived and eventually they become a standard part of the pricing. Um, and you know, my thinking on that initially was if that were to happen in this scenario, it's because most farmers are receiving that premium because they're doing that conservation work. Um, you know, so like it was moving the whole system in, in a different direction or a more positive direction. But I think that's a, a great point. Um, Eric, I had a, a question because you had so much information and, and um, you know, a lot of, of over, a big, an overview of a lot of different options. Where can people go to see more detail about some of those individual things, you know, to see what a regenerative ag plan looks like and and so forth yeah i'd certainly be able to to follow up there's there's a, an array of things that i yeah. would love to point people to or have farther discussions um yeah it's hard to say just one place but um i can put my email again in the chat if people want to follow up okay maybe we can share a couple of links that might be helpful if people are interested in more info on, on any of these. If you guys wanna share any links with me that um, we can send along to the group when I follow up this afternoon. And I'm happy to make the presentation available too. And, yeah. Thanks, that's great. Uh, let's see, Steve, do you have any kind of thoughts? Have you been able to monitor the chat box or if there was anything that stood out to you? Yeah, we need another hour. Yeah, <laughs> we do need it. Well, there's a, there's a few things here. Uh, I'll circle back to one question. This is from Fred in uh, Central Alberta. 
I've been to the Peace River Valley there, probably north of you in Alberta. And uh, yeah, I, I certainly acknowledge the short planning window. I'll just throw out a name for you, Scott Gillespie, who's down here in Calgary, or Andy Kircherman, mm -hmm. also from Alberta. You might want to check into those guys. Um, Kevin Elmy would be another person from Saskatchewan that could help you answer some of your questions. Michael Reber um, from uh, Germany, just ask, you know, he's, he heard that basically you got to have your soil in perfect condition before you start regenerative agriculture practices. I say no. Uh, you want to get it to, uh, you know, maybe more balanced as kind of you indicated there. But you can start, you can start like anywhere your soils, but at any point in uh, where your soil is from. And also the follow up question was, um, just the comment of no kill and cover crops are not enough. And I agree with that. It's so much more than that, that it's the management of the no till, the management of the cover crops. But as I indicated, it's diversity. I, I wish that that could always be included in every definition of regenerative agriculture. Diversity, I think, is a secret to really make everything work better. Um, there's, a, there's two of the top ones there. Jen, I don't know how long you want to go here, but. Um, there's yeah there's there's there is more do we have a little, little more time or um i mean we have a few minutes before we have to wrap up um and i <laughs> i'm struggling a little bit because we have 23 open questions mm -hmm. and two minutes um and i just want to make sure you know that that we kind of hit whatever we can or if there's any other highlights that you guys um want to make sure that we address uh before we wrap up today Let's see. I think I'll I'll touch on this one maybe as as an option to close up. And there's a uh, this item from Jim Biddle that a current concern with selling carbon credits is that once sold, they can no longer be counted for regenerative ag purposes. And how can this be reconciled? And I think that's a good one, you know, because it speaks to how these different incentives are interacting or conflicting with each other does anybody have any thoughts on that or or a place to go with that yeah from from my perspective i don't i don't think that i would push against the idea that just selling selling ecosystem services credits disqualifies you as a as being a regenerative farmer against that idea i don't i don't my my view in our view that wouldn't be the case i think there is kind of an accounting question that that's coming up um regarding when when there are different kind of factors working on an acre so to speak um and that acre sells such credits you know what what can we what kind of claims and what kind of um accounting needs to take place for that but i that's kind of a different question i think let's see we are at one o'clock and i don't want to hold people too long. Um, are there any kind of closing comments or closing thoughts before we wrap up today? All right, everybody's on on time here. So I just want to thank uh, our three panelists today, um, Eric, Ryan, Jenna, thank you so much for your time. Steve, thank you for your expertise. Of course, uh, you'll be here all week. Um, and just to see if anybody has anything they want to say before we wrap up today. Well, I feel like we got a good uh, good start here. I look forward to tomorrow. I'm going to try to take some of these questions here and work them into the next three days. Um, and uh, I really do appreciate, apologize for not getting to answer all of them. Some of them are pretty easy answers, but um, we'll try to take them and incorporate them in. Like we said, that this is recorded. You can look at it later. So looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Right. Sounds good. All right, well, thank you everyone. And like Steve said, we will see you tomorrow. All right, thank you. Thank you.